So we're going to talk about the 1920s here in one of the most uh, famous golf courses to everybody, Augusta. But in my constant effort to squeeze a little bit of history into this class, I wanted to take this moment to talk about the Depression. Starting with a dramatic agricultural disaster out west, the Dust Bowl, improper agricultural practices of removing all the trees brought horrible winds that forced crops to fail. This exacerbated and carried on through the country to where poverty ran wild. From that, we had the stock market crash. And many, many people took to the road looking for jobs. So this was the most horrible financial crisis in the history of the United States. And some people are saying that the what's going on now with the mortgage crisis might be, w w at that time we were in an agricultural economy, and that failed. Now we're in a financial economy where housing prices, the rising housing prices have, have been fueling growth for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, is that structure breaks down, we might be facing something similar to this. And um, these financial events, the stock market crash of 1929, affected golf just as dramatically or almost as dramatically as the Civil War did. It's important to remember that golf is a recreational activity, so it's a uh, funds for golf are extra. So if something's going to be cut out, golf is one of those things. So a lot of plans from the golden age, these great courses that were going to be built, where everybody would have money and be able to do that, those, those went away. Um, lots of members of clubs that didn't get built lost their investments. Um, this was especially hard-hitting on young clubs or new clubs. The older clubs tend to weather these storms because they own their land and have more stable members. But um, construction stops and maintenance suffers. Um, in the Great Depression is when many of these big greens that we talked about when we talked about Charles Blair MacDonald were made smaller just for sheer lack of petrol to um, pay to, to mow. It's interesting, one of the students the other day was talking about one of the members stealing gas from the club. So this hits hard, you know, and, and we're in this year, uh, 2008, um, facing some of these same issues. So it'll be interesting to see, and, and you uh, in later classes will have a better understanding of what's been going on in 2008. A lot of the great architects we've talked about up to this point never recover. They lose fortunes. Tillinghouse, McKenzie um, never recoup the losses that they incurred. Um, we're going to talk about Augusta and in that, that construction, but uh, Dr. Alistair McKenzie's never paid for this. There's actually letters of him writing to Clifford Roberts, the secretary, and saying, please, can I just have a hundred dollars in payment? And uh, uh, Roberts, being the hard guy that he was, said, no, you know, we're trying to keep this, this club afloat. Some of the younger guys um, are able to hang around as superintendents and pros, but you have to think that the guys that were the superintendent and pros then lost their job and maybe ended up traveling the country like the earlier pictures. Um, and then uh, Bendelo, Charles Banks, uh, C.B. McDonald, and Dr. 
Alistair McKenzie die in the 30s. So these times are hard on, on older men also. So one of the bright spots that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about Augusta a little bit, and you should do a little bit of research on your own um, about Augusta. There's lots and lots of information about this club. Bobby Jones, the famous winner of uh, the Grand Slam, uh, two amateur tournaments in England and the United States, and the two professional tournaments in England and the United States. He remained an amateur. He was a lawyer in Augusta, but in Georgia, in Atlanta, but golf was his thing in the summer, and um, Augusta was going to be his go-away club, so he and uh, Clifford Roberts decided to build this golf course, and um, as they were searching for an architect for it, Ross was in the running, but Bobby Jones played Cypress Point, which was uh, done by Dr. Alistair McKenzie, we talked about in the last lecture. He loved it, so Dr. McKenzie was able to build it. Um, and Jones is said he had some help. This was a great site. It was an old arboretum, so lots of great plants, and that's going to factor into the history of Augusta also. This golf course was specifically designed for tournament play, so it's the first TPC in effect. You can see even in these old pictures, um, the mounds, all these spectator mounds, um, allowing lots of uh, what Augusta calls the patrons to enjoy the event. And always since the beginning of this golf tournament, the spectators have been important. And truly, the spectators, really, the tournament was started to save the club. The club was going under. There's, there's records of them just begging people to become members. And these New York guys that were coming down that I envisioned to be like uh, your average Myrtle Beach foursome. You know, hey, you guys can join Augusta for $100. No, it's, it's too much money. So they, they didn't do that. So I wish those, those guys or their children would have... Uh, are, are, are very upset that, that they didn't take that opportunity in the in the depression. So um, big rolling greens, and uh, the golf course is a model for strategic design. So uh, Bobby Jones did not like par fives. He thought he liked two shot holes. So really, even the par fives were designed to be reached in two, but difficult. So uh, very strategic. Um, fun golf course as designed originally by Dr. Alistair McKenzie. Jones was very, very famous at this time. Um, you can see later, here's a picture of, this is Clifford Roberts, Clifford Roberts, this is uh, Bobby Jones, and there's uh, Eisenhower. So much of the, a lot of politics has always been done at Augusta. Um, it said the Eisenhower presidency was constructed um, and masterminded from Augusta and Clifford Roberts. And if you read any history of Augusta, uh, this man here, Clifford Roberts, factors very, very strongly into that. He, he was the one guy that made all the decisions, um, how the tournament was going to be. Um, an incredible micromanager in, in a lot of senses. They... They would, uh, when he arrived to play, uh, the, the gentleman who made his uh, breakfast, his egg sandwich, would relay to the grounds crew his mood, and the pins would be adjusted um, to, to match his mood. So incredible uh, dictator, if you will, of uh, one of the most famous clubs in the world. Dr. Alistair McKenzie uh, wrote a book, Golf Architecture, and I recommend you getting a copy of that and looking at it if you have a chance. And the principles were expressed in the book, and they're also expressed in his design at Augusta. Um, alternate routes were provided, like the links at St. Andrews. Um, Bobby Jones loved the links at St. Andrews. McKenzie loved the links at St. Andrews. Augusta really didn't have any rough. Originally, you could play... In, on different fairways 
and really a, a driver's paradise in a lot of ways. Um, that sense has been changed, and, and there's you can argue for and against the changes, but Augusta's continuously changing their golf courses. Um, the bold golfer, the Arnold Palmer's, or the Phil Mickelson style of golf was rewarded at Augusta. For golf course superintendents, the Augusta factor is always there. The tournament was scheduled for the time when the sports writers were coming back from spring training in Florida, and they convinced them to stop at Augusta for this tournament. So the news media, ever since its inception, has talked about the beautiful magnolias and the flowers and the green, and once we got on television, all golfers see this, and they see this at a time when they're ready to get outside. They've been inside. They haven't been able to play golf. So you get this, why can't our golf course be like Augusta? And I say the answer is it can. If you give me a $6 million budget and close the golf course all summer long, I'll give you that golf course. I have the skills to do that. Are you willing to pay the price? And it's an expensive price to have a golf course that looks that good for that tournament. They're not open during the summer. Um, so it's a spring and fall club. It's a ryegrass. All, all golf is played on ryegrass at Augusta National. And, um, and that's a, a major process. We've had three interns there so far, and it's a great place to do an internship. It fits our schedule very nicely. And you can leave uh, when the course closes in, in uh, June. I think it's the end of May or beginning of June or so. The course has changed. This is uh, the 13th hole, a 455-yard par 5, so reachable by most standards. Magnificent hazard. Um, one of my favorite hazards in golf is the creek. Unfortunately, many golf courses in the modern era have put a culvert in and uh, basically fairwayed over creeks, but they didn't do that at Augusta. Uh, Robert Trent Jones is going to make some changes that make the creek less of a factor and the lake more of a factor, which is unfortunate. But you can see when McKenzie did the golf course, it was a little bit rough around the edges. And now a more modern version, the bunkers have been smoothed, the trees have grown out. So um, even Augusta um, suffers from uh, tree encroachment. You can see lots of air movement um, in the early days. And now um, uh, less air movement, so fans and things are used in those months when the golf course is closed to keep that bent grass the best in the world, the the shortest. The uh, um, this is the first place where really close greens mowing w was used. So the the bikini wax comment, um, it was it's kind of true. This is the first place to have really really fast greens, and all other Golf courses that want to be private, exclusive clubs have been forced to have really fast greens, similar to Augusta. Or not forced, but they've been, it's been pushed on superintendents, and they've pushed it on themselves to try to have these conditions. I show this picture. This is the 10th, uh, a fairway bunker on the 10th hole that used to be a greenside bunker, and this is the only original bunker that still exists from Dr. McKenzie's original design. So Tom, Robert Trent Jones and Tom Fazio and um, Perry Maxwell all have changed Augusta, and every couple of years that changes. So that's something we can discuss. We'll probably discuss in the discussion board. Would it be better if we kept it how it was? Could, then we could compare the golfers, the Gene Saracens and the... Um, Sam Sneeds to the modern golfer, and, and you guys can be the judge of that. Augusta allows a poor golfer a pleasurable round. The, the members' tees are generous, and it's a fun place to play golf. Um, a smart, thinking golfer can, can go low there. It's a magnificent routing. And their website has lots of the history, again, it was a 
the the Fruitland Nursery, um, bought by Bobby Jones and Clifford Roberts. It's in Augusta, Georgia, but there's not a lot of mixing between the population of Augusta and the members. The members tend to fly in to the airport, get in a limo, go to the club and stay there all there. They eat there. They stay in the cabins there. Um, they don't go out and mix. There's a McDonald's, um, you know, not two drivers and a wedge away from there that has all kinds of pictures of the club. And it, as I was standing in there having breakfast on one of my visits, I thought, you know, these people, 95% of these people in this McDonald's will never, ever even see that club. Um, it's, you know, such an important history of golfing, but it just kind of blends into the town, and they, they keep people out aggressively. Um, in the 40s, Trespassers were actually, there was a group of, children, of uh, teenagers that went in to, uh, to fish and were shot by one of the security guards. So it's uh, an interesting history. And, uh, you know, there, there are armed guards there. You have to, have to sign in. You can't get into this club without approval of the club. So uh, things are on edge there. It's very different from St. Andrews and Pinehurst where you can just walk out on the course and anybody can can look at it just an example of the website all the holes are named um, one of my favorites the short par 3 12th hole which factors very strongly there's there's the tee shot over the water to the very one of the narrowest greens in golf um, a green that has they, they store back here in the in the woods uh, lights that are brought out to keep the screen healthy it's so shaded they don't want to cut any of these trees so they they pull lights over that in the summer to, uh, or even in the winter to keep that grass growing but uh, the golden bell so the forsythia so this um, hole is named after the the forsythia all there's 18 different plants um, all the holes are named after that, and we'll talk about that when we have plant materials class uh, for the freshmen next semester. So that's a little bit of Augusta history. We're not going to talk about it that much. We'll, we'll revisit Augusta a few times when it gets redone. But here's one of the guys that actually does a little bit of work at Augusta also is Perry Maxwell. And the West, um, Oklahoma, Texas tended to weather the depression a little bit better. They had oil. Um, there was still demand for oil, so these guys were able to keep things going. Maxwell works with McKenzie, um, and one of their one of the neat golf courses is uh, Crystal Downs up in northern Michigan, which is a, a sandy, sandy soiled hilly place, and then the University of Michigan golf course. Um, if you go to Old Town in Winston-Salem, a very old exclusive club, Perry Maxwell did that. And he's the most prolific designer in the Depression. He's doing work for these oil people in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Kansas. And um, he's hired to build a theme course, Southern Hills Country Club. This the Cary Salt family in Hutchinson, Kansas, hires him to build this Prairie Dunes, also a striking Lynx golf course. Um, it was only a nine-hole golf course at the time, but for 20 years it was the number one nine-hole golf course uh, in the country. Uh, rated by Golf Digest and all the golf course architect people liked it. So in 1957... Uh, his son finishes it, so Prairie Dunes is now an 18-hole golf course with the wide-open Lynx-style routing. Um, it does have the butterfly. You go off this way, and you go off this way, but you can see very wide, windswept, neat golf course. The Maxwell Rolls um, are a term... Uh, used for his greens, severely contoured. And in the 1930s, Augustus built 
They don't get a, they don't get a lot of members. They don't get a lot of play. It goes, actually, chickens are raised out on the fairways a little bit. It needs a little bit of fixing, so Maxwell comes in and redoes 1, 10, and 14. So even before the tournament starts, Augusta starts to be changed. And then uh, Perry Maxwell also has a hand in some of the greens at Pine Valley. Here's McKenzie and Maxwell's work at Crystal Downs. Um, Crystal Downs is a great learning lab um, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, the houses are so far offset, and this is because the the lake is out out here. So people built their houses by the lake, which left them off of or far removed from the golf course. So the golf course remains open and, and windswept and unchanged. Um, very far northern Michigan, Traverse City. So there was never a lot of money to redo the golf course, so it stayed in its, some of its original McKinsey design. There's a famous story of uh, the 18th hole at Crystal Downs is a short par 3. And um, Dr. McKinsey was a legendarily dairy drinker, and he, he had been up all night one night, and he took the plans to Perry Maxwell and showed them to him. And he said, well, this is a great golf course except you. There's only 17 holes, so they had to squeeze in another hole at the end, so they just put this par 3, which is actually a pretty good hole, but um, an a interesting golf course. During the Depression in Pinehurst, the town came up with their own money, actually. You were paid in Pinehurst script, and you were able to buy stuff at the town store with the town script. So Donald Ross did not travel during this time. He stayed in number two, and they did a lot of work. They paid people in this money to work on Pinehurst number two. And uh, part of that was due to... Donald Ross not getting the job at Augusta that he really wanted, so he, in turn, tried to make Pinehurst number two competitive as a golf course to test the best golfers in the world. By 1936, the greens at Pinehurst were being converted to Bermuda grass. Um, and here's a picture of Donald Ross putting on sand putting greens. And there's the, actually the Pinehurst Clubhouse in the, in the background. So it looks like he's out there by the maintenance facility. Practice putting. So this is the time when we get these deceptive strategic greens that the turtleback greens and the the little shots that punish the good golfer but allow the bad golfer to have fun also by having these big contours in the greens you can make a big green seem much smaller And Ross considers Pinehurst number two his finest achievement. And it's definitely worth a look. In the pretty famous 18th hole where Payne Stewart won the 99 U.S. Open. So as we begin to come out of the Depression in the 30s, some historic stuff happens. The, the WPA, the Works Program, hires up these people that don't have jobs and puts them to work uh, building infrastructure for the United States. So we move from an agrarian economy into the Industrial Revolution. When golf courses were built in the golden age, 
Many, many men were used to build those uh, golf courses. Um, as we move forward, um, less men are going to be required to build a golf course. You can probably build a golf course with 10 to 12 guys um, now with the bulldozers are brought in. Um, during the Depression, uh, actually, Tillinghouse was was hired by the WPA. He was broke, and he was hired to go around and lead some of these work crews to do work on some, some golf courses. And uh, it said he removed 7,427 bunkers um, for the, the PGA. Um, my go old golf course, Meadowbrook, where I grew up caddying, uh, some books have Tillinghouse as the architect. Um, he's not. He actually visited it and um, said it was fine. He said that, that where it was a great golf course, but the, some of the Tillinghouse people said that, you know, all those golf courses he visited, he gets accredited with designing them. So, um, And then there's some controversy around Bethpage Black. Um, he might have done, they're pretty sure he did the layout, but they don't think he did the greens because the greens at Bethpage don't have the contours that many of the Tillinghouse Green's head, so I thought it was interesting. He went around and removed bunkers. World War II brings the United States out of the Depression. It puts men back to work. Um, it does further hinder maintenance. Um, there's The gasoline shortages are increased by the war. But um, the technology that comes out of World War II, the tank in particular is brought to construction of golf courses later and allows much faster more rapid construction with the modern day bulldozers World War II the history of that is devastating we're not going to talk about that much um, but uh, Turnberry one of the famous golf courses was paved over for an airfield many many bombs uh, were dropped on Europe and in Britain and uh, golf really was not a high priority during this time um, and one of the things Witten said is uh, you know young associates guys that had worked with Tillinghouse and Ross uh, went to the war and, and died so there was a after World War II when the US comes back is a great victor of this great war in Europe and and the Industrial Revolution takes over and everybody has a house and extra money, there's a need for golf courses. There's a need for recreation. And that's going to uh, quickly be filled by Robert Trent Jr. that we're going to talk about in our next lecture. So after the war, by 1953, 100 new courses are opening each year. So there's a need for golf course architects. The capability is there to build golf courses much more quickly. Um, we went from hand. This this is the de the depression. We're building sidewalks by hand, um, and 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 very well. I might add a lot of uh, great part. The Blue Ridge Parkway was built this way, um, and my hometown Heinz Park was built this way. Lots of old uh, golf courses and old parks were constructed uh, with stone. And um, with work crews, with, with men that the Depression put to work and then the, the war put to work also. But coming back from that, um, this guy right here, Robert Trent Jones Sr., pictured here with Donald Ross at the first meeting of the Golf Course Architects Association of America is uniquely positioned to become the architect of the John Wayne era and we'll talk about that next time.